Too busy listening to Michael Jackson records to watch a full-length horror movie syllabus video? Well, don't feel bad, because we got just the thing to beat it. Check out our recap of the horror thrillers video that we've done, and then stick around for a new doctorate level selection. Oh, and uh, the kid is not my son. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Horror Movie Syllabus. My name is Professor Victor, and I'll be your host as we go through all of the essential, noteworthy, interesting, and notorious modern horror films. If you're new to the channel, I recommend you check out our introduction video. There's a link to that in the description below. It'll give you a pretty good idea of what the Horror Movie Syllabus is about, but in short, we take a particular subgenre of horror, and then we pick three movies from that subgenre to explore. But today, we're not really doing that. Today, we're doing a recap of a previous video as we do our Doctorate series. Yeah, we basically are going to go over our horror thriller video that we did, give you a quick recap of the movies that we talked about in that video, and then pick a new fourth doctorate level selection. A little bit more of a, maybe a deeper cut or a, a lesser known movie to talk about in this subgenre. If you missed our previous video on horror thrillers, we talked a lot about the distinction between a thriller movie and a horror movie and trying to figure out what the distinction was, only to come to the conclusion that there really isn't a clear, bright line. It really is kind of a, a gut feeling. You kind of know when you see it, even though we discussed some of the different uh, ways that people propose making a distinction, such as focusing on the investigation versus focusing on the killer, which was one of my suggestions, or focusing on, you know, the police rather than focusing on uh, the victims or the killer. Anyways, there was a lot of discussion about this, but at the end of the day, it is kind of a you-know-when-you-see-it situation, and I think that was reflected in the movies that we discussed during that video. Uh, we talked a little bit about how those movies didn't always adhere to one bright line rule, but you kind of got a feel for what a thriller horror movie would be. And I think that'll be true when we go to our doctor level selections today, because you'll see that they also don't follow any of these specific bright line rules. They focus a little bit more on uh, uh, anti-heroes, but we'll get to that in a minute. First, let's go ahead and get into this recap right now. The first movie that we discussed on our previous video on horror thrillers was The Talented Mr. Ripley. And we spent some time talking about the quality of this film, how it was you know, an A-list cast and crew, an A-list director, A-list stars, kind of a prestige movie that had uh, a pedigree behind it, if you will. It had a lot of uh, quality and money behind it, and it was very much a mainstream film, or at least meant to be a mainstream film, that really didn't seem to stick around and become the classic that you might have thought it would based on that pedigree. Uh, we talked a little bit about that. We talked about the book series that it was derived from and adapting, uh, and how much I love that book series, how I wish they had really kept going with that book series, or adapting that book series. Uh, and we talked a bit about why maybe it hasn't endured as a classic uh, the way I would have thought it would have, and how maybe the fact that it's a period piece, or the fact that it dealt with uh, gay themes might have been something that put people off at the time that it came out. Uh, but all of those things are just factors in what winds up being a movie that probably deserves more love than it's getting, uh, and so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to highlight it here on the syllabus. The next movie that we discussed in the video was The Silence of the Lambs, and this is another movie with a big pedigree, a lot of A-list talent behind the camera and in front of the camera, uh, and one that swept the Academy Awards. We talked about all of that, and we talked about, again, it's another book adaptation. It's a darn near perfect book adaptation of a book that I really like, uh, and it's really basically kind of a flawless movie. We spent a lot of time talking about all of the elements of this movie and how they all come together pretty much darn near perfectly without really anything you can complain about. The movie is essentially flawless, and that was reflected in the critical acclaim it got. And we talked about how this is a perfect example of the kind of movie that people like to call a thriller rather than a horror movie because of the critical acclaim, because it was so popular, because it was so well made, people didn't want to give it the credit as being a horror movie, which, you know, kind of is irksome. But that is one of the things that we focused on when we discussed this movie in the previous video. And the last movie on the syllabus that we discussed for the horror thrillers was Seven. And with Seven, we talked a lot about David Fincher, the director of the movie, and how important his influence on that movie was aesthetically and in terms of the tone of the movie, which was incredibly dark, gory, and graphic, and, and really unsettling for a very mainstream movie with mainstream stars in Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman. These dark and horrific elements, these gory elements, are what set the movie apart from your standard 
top cop movie, Cop Fair, and made it really stand out as something that felt, at least at the time, unique and original, though it's been copied ad nauseum since then. This movie at the time really hit hard, especially because of the bleak ending. And we talked about all of this in the video about how this movie really is uh, a daring movie at the time that really kind of set the tone for the 90s and beyond. So those are the movies that we discussed in our previous horror thrillers video. And now it's time to look at a new doctorate level selection. Our doctorate level selection for the horror thriller subgenre is You Were Never Really Here. You Were Never Really Here came out in 2017 and is an incredibly well-made, well-crafted film with an incredible performance by, by star Joaquin Phoenix. And it is a really interesting take on a, a violent character and a violent profession, uh, but really making it into more of a character study rather than a gratuitous, violent, scary, uh, upsetting film. Uh, but we'll get into all that in just a second. If you haven't seen it before, Joaquin Phoenix plays a war veteran who is suffering from severe trauma, both from his childhood and from the war and from his job working for the government. Uh, and he now takes uh, the odd job basically as a, a hitman or a hired mercenary to rescue young girls from slavery, sex trafficking. Uh, and he takes on uh, a call from a, a U.S. senator to rescue his daughter from such a slavery, sex trafficking ring. Uh, and I guess I'll say hijinks abound, but it doesn't really feel like a hijinks kind of movie. Uh, and I'll explain why in, in just a few moments. But when we talk about You're we Never Really Here, we have to talk about director Lynn Ramsey, uh, who I didn't really know until I started digging into the research for this this, this video. Uh, but she's also the director of uh, We Need to Talk About Kevin. And that's another really great movie. And they have a lot of similarities uh, in the fact that... Um, they both take their time to tell a story, and they are very much a show-don't-tell kind of story, which I absolutely love. Ramsey does a really good job of letting the story unfold at a, 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 I'll say a methodical place. It doesn't ever feel slow, but it doesn't really rush either. And she's not dumping exposition on you. She's not spelling everything out for you. She's not underscoring and key on important points for you. She is letting it unfold naturally through flashbacks, visual imagery, uh, visual matches, graphic matches, uh, music, and incredible performances. She knows to just point the camera at her stars and let them do their job. And it works very, very well in this movie, just like it did in We Need to Talk About Kevin. Because Joaquin Phoenix gives, as usual, an incredible performance. We have talked about Joaquin in the past. We probably will in the future. He is probably one of our best living working actors right now. And he continually shows it by doing really interesting performances. He takes a performance and does something interesting, not just with his acting, like with his voice and his, his dialogue, uh, but also his face and his body. He's a body actor. He really sells you in the performance by the way he moves and stands. It's a really uh, magnificent trait of his, uh, ability of his, talent of his. Uh, and it's on full display in this movie because the movie is following him as this burned out, uh, kind of drifter seeming uh, uh, Vietnam or a uh, war veteran that is um, that is now doing this kind of black ops work where he's going in there and uh, assassinating sex traffickers uh, and rescuing women, uh, young girls. It's a, a really interesting performance because it's not what you think it would be, and I think it's the marriage of Joaquin's performance with Ramsey's direction that makes it work because you're expecting this to be almost like a Rambo type movie where. The, you know, Joaquin's character, Joe, is going to be like this badass who goes in there and just kicks everybody's ass and, and saves the day. And really, that's not what you get. It really is a character study where the violence mostly happens kind of off screen or just sudden and quickly or shown in a way that you don't expect it to be. And like you're just not even really quite sure how to react to it, which makes it feel all the more visceral, all the more real. You know, there's the, the one scene where he goes into the, the brothel to try to save the girl. And it's all shown through like uh, closed circuit television, you know, security cameras. And, and you're, you're, a lot of it's not really on the screen or it cuts away. And you don't see 
what you're expecting to see. And, and in a way, you kind of don't get the payoff either. You want to see these people punished because they're really horrendous people doing really horrendous things. And you kind of aren't given that. And it's kind of disjointed and almost surreal, uh, which kind of really maybe shows you the perspective of your main protagonist, Joe, because he's a little off and having uh, some emotional issues, some trauma, trauma issues that he's dealing with. And it's a really clever and interesting way to show the violence that both is not gratuitous and also sometimes feels a little more gratuitous because it feels a little bit more real when it's sudden, when it's unexpected, when it comes out of nowhere, or when you can't quite see it and your brain starts taking over and, and filling in the blanks for you. It's a really effective way of doing things. And I think that uh, Lynn Ramsey did a masterful job of, of displaying the violence in this manner. It all goes along with her her show don't tell methodology. She really is letting the story unfold naturally. The violence happens on screen, but like not where you can see it. You get flashbacks, but you get them in pieces. Kind of like in uh, we need to talk about Kevin, where they're not going to give you the whole thing all at once, and you're going to have to piece it together, and you're going to have to work for it. She trusts her audience to understand what is you know what is going on and to fill in the blanks yourself and let the mystery kind of come together, and it works really really well. It really does a great job of unraveling this character for us and letting us see who he is and why he is the way he is. And by by minimizing the violence the way she does, and I use the word minimize loosely because, again, it's still impactful, it, it gives you a focus to the effects of the violence rather than the violence itself. Or how it makes people feel, what happens because of it. Uh, what is the short and long-term uh, consequences of that violence? That's where the focus of the movie is on. That's what the whole central theme of the movie seems to be about. And it's done beautifully. It's a wonderful example of a, a director and an actor coming together to deliver a really powerful and moving movie that works extremely well. I really have no complaints with the movie at all. And all I want to do is check out all the rest of Lynn Ramsey's work because she's only done four movies. She's very uh, picky uh, and meticulous about what she wants to do. She she wants to make sure her vision shows up on screen and she would rather quit than compromise that. And I respect that. And I think it shows up in the movie very well. She's a very confident director, letting the story be told visually, using music, which was, by the way, for Radiohead fans, done by Johnny Greenwood. And it, it works wonderfully in this. Uh, it, it really is a great adaptation of a, apparently of a book that I've never read uh, by a guy named Jonathan Ames, who apparently is more known for comedy stuff. So when you see this movie, which is not funny in the slightest, um, it'd be hard to believe that it's coming from a guy who's known for comedy. Uh, and I'm kind of curious to check out the book now because of it, because the movie is a very serious, somber affair, kind of dark, some dark subject matter when you're talking about things like sex trafficking of young girls. Uh, so, you know, be aware of that. And, and you're not going to completely get the satisfaction of of seeing them get their comeuppance because it's kind of the way it's shot. But it is definitely one that's worth watching, worth checking out if you haven't seen it. If you like Joaquin Phoenix, it's a must-see. But it's a really well-made movie that explores stuff that I don't think it's explored very often in, in horror movies or thriller movies or horror thriller movies. And I really find it to be a refreshing and interesting take on a, a really troubled soul who's very violent uh, and it's not a gratuitous movie at all but I think it's something that horror fans would probably really find interesting so that's our doctorate level selection for the horror thriller subgenre but of course I've got an extra credit selection for you as well because that's how I roll and today's extra credit selection is a movie called Nightcrawler now, Nightcrawler came out in 2014 and is a little bit more mainstream than uh, You Were Never Really Here. And it's probably one of the more mainstream movies that we talked about. But that does tend to fit the, the thriller subgenre, as we discussed in the previous video. These movies tend to be a little bit more mainstream. But despite this one being mainstream and having a bit of a cult following, it still seems to fly a lot more under the radar than you would expect, given its pedigree. If you haven't seen it before, the movie stars Jake Gyllenhaal as a freelance videographer who basically goes around at night trying to find various accidents or crime scenes or violent acts to film so that he can sell them to news agencies looking for video footage to air with their broadcasts. And he starts to get more and more into this and gets a little bit more unscrupulous as he starts to cross the line and doctor scenes to try to get the shot or break rules to try to get the shot. And of course, hijinks abound, as they tend to do. Uh, but we'll stop there so as to not spoil the movie. Uh, but the movie is, again, really, really well made and uh, drafting off of the performance of its star, Jake Gyllenhaal, who gives a masterful performance in this movie. Perhaps one of, if not his absolute best so far. Uh, the movie really leverages his charm uh, and the, the, his ability to go dark 
And he's given this really interesting performance where he is somebody you gravitate towards, but he's also somebody you're kind of put off by, and yet you are still with him throughout the whole movie, which is a, a sign of a great performance for me. If you can take an unlikable character and make me want to follow him, you're doing a really good job, and Jake's doing a really good job here. And it's worth noting that Jake Gyllenhaal, who is, you know, objectively a very good-looking man, is not so much that he looks ugly here, but he's he's playing in such a way, like, kind of almost like, animalistic or kind of like conniving and like wicked but not but also charming he's not playing off of his good looks he's really playing off of a character who is just slick kind of slick and clever and that's what's carrying him through the movie not his not his handsome looks and i thought that was an interesting choice he deliberately tried to downplay that and instead try to just create this character who is a survivor basically basically somebody doing whatever it takes to get the money that he needs to survive. And that's where the focus of the movie is. The theme of the movie is on this um, this idea of immoral consumerism, or even amoral consum consumerism, really. Basically, where making money justifies doing whatever you have to do to make that money. Uh, and the movie focuses on that a lot and really wants to uh, kind of shine a light on how the voyeur culture of today, or even back then, which is only a few years ago, but uh, it's still very, very true today, feeds into this consumerism. The news station is willing to uh, pay him more and more money for more and more gory graphic stuff that is highlighting basically uh, really horrific and bad things happening to affluent and white people, preferably by poor people and minorities, to push a certain narrative that is uh, voraciously consumed by their by their viewers. It's a really interesting commentary that isn't as uh, heavy handed as I'm making it sound right now, actually, but it is fairly heavy-handed, uh, but the movie is doing so many interesting things, and it's got such great performances, not just by Jake Gyllenhaal, but also Riz Ahmed as his, uh, as his co-worker slash driver, and Rene Russo as the news person who's buying the footage from him. Really great performances all across the board, and just a really well-crafted movie. It's neat because it's, it's it's kind of a story that you don't see very often. It's not, uh, you know, an area uh, or a profession that I'm super familiar with, and I think it was a good idea to highlight this kind of uh, you know, subculture, if you will, these people who drive out through the nights trying to chase down police scanner uh, alerts and, and film them was a really interesting idea. And this movie, you know, which is an indie movie, it was made for a really low amount of money, really does a great job of capturing this this subculture, this this profession that I wasn't familiar with, and making it really compelling. They did a great job of leveraging what they did have available to them from really quality actors willing to work on this movie, uh, this lower budget movie, uh, to uh, James Newton Howard's score, which I have to mention because it's it's really incongruous with the movie itself. Like he's doing some electronic stuff and and he's making the movie see the music seem more upbeat than the movie would have you believe, which is apparently supposed to reflect uh, 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 the character Jake's character, uh, uh, Lou Bloom is his name reflect his inner monologue basically basically the way he sees the world he sees this as all positive things uh, for his career and his opportunities to make money when we're seeing it as tragedies and horrific things really interesting idea that works extremely well uh, i also like that the marketing campaign for this was really uh, unique where they made uh, like linkedin and twitter profiles and craigslist ads for lou bloom the character as if he was a real person that's all fun stuff and really clever ways to get this movie out there and it did get out there it made some money it got some Academy Award recognition. It made some. It made some buzz, and it does have a cult following. And yet, people don't seem to rave about it. It doesn't seem like it gets talked about uh, unless it's like, "Oh yeah, I did see that movie. That was really good." People don't seem to talk about it as much, which is why I wanted to talk about it here because I think it's great. I think it doesn't get enough love. I think that the performances need to be be highlighted. The 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 whole idea, the script, everything needs to be highlighted because it's a really excellent movie that people seem to be familiar with, but nobody seems to be raving about. It, it deserves to be raved about. Uh, it it narrowly got beat out by uh, you were never really here just because I feel like that movie deserves even more of a spotlight because it doesn't even have that much of a cult following. People just don't seem to know about it. So I put that one above this one, but the are both definitely ones you should check out. Definitely worth your time, worth your love. Uh, so check it out and let me know what you think if you haven't seen it. So that's going to do it for our revisiting of the horror thriller subgenre. If you like talking about these movies and hearing about these movies, please check out the previous video if you haven't already. And of course, leave comments about what you think are your favorite horror thrillers and how you think the distinction between horror and thrillers should be made, because I'd like to hear your thoughts on the subject matter. You can do that in the comments of this video or in the previous one. I'm good either way because I'm going to read them either way.
But now let's take a look at the uh, Horror Trivia Pursuit card for the week and, uh, and try to answer this question live on camera. I'm going to go ahead and go with the psychological category because both of these movies are kind of psychological character studies uh, of their respective protagonists or, or anti-heroes. Uh, so the question for this week, I need classes to read it. <laughs> and the question for this week is, at the end of 1933's The Invisible Man, what form is the dead Dr. Jack Griffin in? His visible form or his invisible form? And once again, we've got one of these binary questions, and I don't love these. I don't love these kind of either-or questions, these yes or no, like true or false type questions, because they're just binary picks. They're 50-50 chance. They're not as challenging. I mean, you can still get it wrong, obviously, but it just doesn't lend itself to as much thought process. You know, I usually prattle on a bit to give you guys some time to think about it, but you're either thinking, you know, visible or invisible. You're thinking visible or invisible, and I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, uh, but... I just I, I wish we could get a, you know maybe just drop the question and just say what form was he in I mean I guess that's still a binary question if you know the plot of the movie so I don't know maybe maybe there's just a better way to phrase that question and we've gotten a couple of these in a row it feels like and they kind of bum me out I, I maybe also because I like to hear bad answers from you guys bad wrong answers and it doesn't really lend itself to that when you have a question like this but I have seen that movie, of course. It's been a little while since I've seen it, but not that long ago. I revisited it a couple of years ago because it had been a while, and I was kind of watching some Universal Horror movies. We'll talk more about that in the future, possibly. Uh, but it's a great movie. It's one of my favorites of the Universal Monsters. I really like The Invisible Man. Uh, I also thought the remake was really good. We did talk about that on the channel previously. Uh, but enough dawdling. Let me just get into it. Uh, so, visible or invisible, uh, I'm pretty sure he's visible at the end of the movie. I'm almost positive of it. I'm like 95% sure. Uh, and I, I give myself 5% because I always start to second guess myself at these things. That's another thing. When you're second guessing yourself on a, a you know an either or question like this, you know, it's just like you might as well just go with the original choice. Visible is my original choice. I'm sticking with it. Uh, hopefully you got, you got the same answer because it is the visible form. His visible form is the correct answer, which, yeah, again, not, not the greatest of questions. I'm not even going to, you know... Uh, be too proud about getting that one because it's a little too easy I feel like if you've seen the movie at least uh, so I don't know I, tell me if you think I'm wrong and I'm you know being a cranky old man about these questions you let me know in the comments below but uh, hopefully you stuck around this long to play the game and answer the question uh, hopefully you enjoyed the video we talked about again if you like horror thrillers check out the previous video and uh, leave a comment below we'll, we'll talk more about horror thrillers because I love talking about them they're great movies uh, and until next week when we do something completely different class dismissed